Hello and welcome to Projector, and on this episode, Linda Hamilton and Arnold Schwarzenegger return to the Terminator franchise to once more save humanity from a dark fate. In Mexico City, a deadly new kind of Terminator, the Rev-9, played by Gabriel Luna, has been sent from the future, and his target is Danny Ramos, played by Natalia Reyes, who will play an important role in stopping the machines. But a protector also arrives from the future in the form of an augmented human called Grace, played by Mackenzie Davis, who is soon joined by Sarah Connor, played by Linda Hamilton, to help save Danny. Now they must join forces in this new future as it moves towards a new Judgment Day and find a way of destroying the most un unstoppable Terminator yet. Back in 1984, the original Terminator was the little movie that could. It was a low-budget film, but its combination of action, sci-fi, romance, and horror really connected with audiences and their imaginations, and it shot to the top of the box office, where it became almost instantly iconic and catapulted both Arnold Schwarzenegger and director James Cameron into stardom pretty much overnight. And it's a damn good chase movie even to this day. It's genuinely exhilarating and quite scary in a way that none of the films following have really ever been. When they reunited back in 1991 for Terminator 2 Judgment Day, it was a much grander affair. It's essentially a big budget remake of the first film, featuring at the time groundbreaking special effects, and it still holds up to this day. If the original Terminator is most remembered for Arnold walking out of the police station saying, I'll be back, then Terminator 2 essentially wrote the blueprint for the modern blockbuster. All the films that have come since then have tried to essentially recapture that film's success, and it's a bar that none of the Terminator movies that followed have really ever been able to top. Cameron left the franchise from this point forward, but Schwarzenegger was coaxed back with a whole bunch of money for 2003's Rise of the Machines, which essentially is just another do-over of Terminator 2, but did have a surprisingly brave nihilistic ending, so I will give them points for that, but it was genuinely felt to be a disappointment, especially after the long wait. It was very highly anticipated at the time. 2009's Salvation is probably much more remembered for Christian Bale's on-set tirade than anything actually in it, and that's because it's dreadfully boring and pretty much isn't worth mentioning. They tried to reboot the series in 2015 with Genesis that essentially said, you remember those Terminator movies? We're rebooting it all, even the ones that you liked! And audiences pretty roundly rejected it and its plans for a whole new trilogy, and thus the rights eventually went back to James Cameron. So now we have another reboot that essentially goes back to Terminator 2. Everything after that has been scrubbed, and Cameron is the producer this time out, and he's put in some ideas of his own. But the question is, are audiences really going to be interested, even if you have the director of Deadpool, Tim Miller, this time out? Because while Terminator was extremely popular, that wave of inferior sequels has really eroded audience goodwill. So honestly, this might be the last time it'll be back. Terminator Dark Fate starts off very strongly. It essentially picks up right from where Terminator 2 left off, but it also does so spiritually at the same time. One of the best things that Miller does with his direction is that he manages to recapture some of the tone that Cameron set with those first two films in a way that none of the subsequent sequels have ever truly been able to. That's partly because this is an R-rated Terminator film for the first time since Rise of the Machines, and that gives Miller full license to be very down and dirty and very aggressive with the material. It feels full force. It's not PG-13 and neutered like the other Terminator movies that just feel like generic smash-em-ups. This very much feels like a Terminator movie from the outset, and that's also because he brings the series essentially back to basics in that we've got an assassin and a protector and an innocent in the middle of them, and it's a race against time to see which one of them 
is going to get to her first. And so the dynamic of the Terminator films is restored here, and there's also the fact that the opening act culminates in a double bill action sequence. And this opening movement is all the things the Terminator film should be. It's tense, it's exciting, and it puts you on the edge of your seat, in large part because Miller is uncompromising and unsentimental. He knows that when James Cameron introduced those other the Sarah Connors in the phone book to immediately whittle them down, the reason he did so is to make sure that you never feel safe because you know that whatever's pursuing her is brutal and relentless. So he does the same tactic here. He introduces characters and then immediately discards them in surprisingly quick fashion. And so that makes sure that your adrenaline keeps pumping, especially as the movie seamlessly goes from the one action piece into the second one and keeps building and building and building until that reintroduction of Sarah Connor, played once again by Linda Hamilton. And that, I think, is maybe the film's genuine ace card. She didn't want to reprise her role back in 2003 because she didn't think there was anywhere new to take Sarah as a character, so they infamously wrote her off with just a bit of dialogue. And ever since then, this franchise has been lacking something because I do think that Hamilton is one of the major reasons why the first two films worked as well as they did. She's essentially the protagonist in the original, and in the second, not only does she have that remarkable transformation, but also she has a major character arc, and she bookends the film with her narration. What Hamilton provided with her performances was a level of humanity and an emotional throughline that elevated those films. So when you bring her back into the fold, those qualities also return, and Hamilton reprises the part after nearly 30 years without even missing a beat. She curses, she growls, and she throws herself into the action. She's still an incredibly formidable presence on the screen, and is so intense, and yet underneath that, you know that there is a certain level of vulnerability still there. And this is a slightly different Sarah than we've seen before, because even though this is the toughened version of her from Terminator 2, it's a Sarah that's trying to find her purpose. She feels lost ever since Judgment Day has passed and because of other certain events, and now she doesn't know what to do with herself. Her life has been devoted to this one cause and this one thing only, and it's left her isolated and alone. And what this movie does is that it puts her with two characters that are essentially mirror images of her, and she ends up being a mental figure to both of them. So on the one hand, you have Danny, who is basically what Sarah was going through in the first movie. As Sarah puts it, she cares because she was her wants. Danny thinks that she's just this ordinary, everyday person, and then suddenly her entire life is completely destroyed, and now she has to accept her own destiny. She has to forge her way into a future where she becomes important and significant, and become that person, summon up a strength that she didn't even know that she had. And on the other hand, you have Grace, who is essentially an amalgamation of Carl Reese, the T-800 from Terminator 2, and a little bit of Sarah. It's almost like a continuation of the idea in Terminator 2, where Sarah became so intent on stopping Judgment Day that she became a cold, remorseless killer. She essentially became a machine, like a Terminator herself. And Grace takes that idea to the next level beyond that because she is literally part machine. She has been fighting for the resistance and spent her entire life going up against the machines to the extent that she's become one herself. She has become this cyborg that has been enhanced solely 
for the purpose of fighting back against Terminators. And Mackenzie Davis is one of the major reasons I was curious about this film, because I think that she's a really great actor. She's uniformly good from supporting roles in things like That Awkward Moment or The Martian, to leading roles in indie flicks like Izzy Gets the Fudge Across Town. But I didn't know if she would truly convince as an action hero, but she totally does. Her tall, athletic frame really sells the idea that she's fast, agile, and very, very powerful. And also, she stands convincingly toe-to-toe -to -toe with Hamilton as Sarah Connor, and few performers can pull that off, even if they do have a sort of forced, semi-antagonistic relationship on screen. The problem isn't really to do with the performers, the problem is the script and the characterization it affords them, or namely, the lack thereof. It sets up the ideas of these characters, but it never truly fleshes them out in a significant way. So, we have the idea that Sarah's meant to be something of a lost soul, but we don't see that. As she describes herself, I drink and I kill Terminators. And what we see in this film is pretty much her inner element. Likewise, you never really feel that Grace is truly conflicted about the fact that she's had to give up a certain level of her humanity in order to survive, in order to fight another day. Even Salvation, with the character of Marcus, did more with this idea than I do think that Dark Fate does, which is genuinely odd. But also, Danny as a character just generally falls into the background. Natalia Rees doesn't really make too much of an impression. She's often crowded out by Davis and Hamilton. And that really is a shame, because those are very, very promising on paper, but it never really expands upon it to get the true level of emotion they could really get out of these characters. If a lot of what I'm saying sounds very familiar from both the Cameron films, but also some of the later sequels as well, then that's because Dark Fate's biggest problem is that it keeps looking towards the past rather than trying to write a new future for itself. It was about halfway through when I realised that what it was doing was copying the structure of T2, but in a new setting. Especially when you really realise that dual-pronged double-action set-piece is replicating the initial Galleria confrontation followed by the motorcycle chase. It even replicates one of the major faults in T2 in that it has a second act that massively slows down once they go into the desert. In this film's case, it's because they're trying to cross the Mexican border into Texas in a sequence that feels like it's come out of a Sicario movie. What I will say, though, is that I did appreciate that it had very sympathetic portrayals of the Mexican characters within it and this whole situation, which is completely radically different to another franchise throwback, Rambo Last Blood, which opened last month. It's almost the polar opposite of that in many ways. And I did like the fact that the relocation and the fact that many of the early scenes are in Spanish at least gave this a different texture and feeling to many of the other Terminator movies. But even though the characters are smuggling themselves across the border, and obviously this ties in with the current political climate, there isn't actually a lot of commentary there. Even when the Rev-9 takes the form of a border patrol officer, it has less charge than when the T-1000 took the form of a cop. He's replicating himself as an authority figure, but it's not really doing anything with it. And this, I think, is emblematic of a franchise that has lost sight of what it's trying to say. The first two films were very much rooted in anxieties about nuclear war, but that's less of a concern these days. A truly updated Terminator film would really try and tap into the fears of technology, especially with the ideas of replacing workers with robots, or the modern surveillance culture that we have, and there are vague moments where Dark Fate does that. For example, the Rev-9 manages to connect to CCTV. Sarah's very paranoid about her phone. The Rev-9 uses a drone like a missile, but it never coheres into a solid theme. And in its place is a whole bunch of references to other Terminator films, and it really does get distracting after a certain point. You almost want to scream, just please do something different. Different. You don't have to keep doing all these throwbacks just to generate a little bit of audience goodwill. It even gets to the extent where the Rev-9 lands in a barbecue and it's played
playing on the radio the same song that's playing in the bar at the beginning of T2. Why is that necessary? But even major things are outright duplicated. Like there's a sequence where they're driving in a truck being chased by the Rev-9 in a helicopter. Just like the sequence in Terminator 2. You're not even homaging at that point, you're just outright copying. It's a facsimile of something that you've done before. Speaking of the Rev-9, that's one of the major disappointments of this movie. I do actually quite like the design, the liquid metal going over the endoskeleton. That's a lot like the TX in Terminator 3, but this takes that one step beyond because he can separate that liquid metal skin into a whole separate entity that can be controlled remotely. So it's Essentially, it's like two Terminators at the same time. He becomes his own tag team, and that does use some interesting and creative scenarios during the action set pieces. But in terms of actual performance, Gabriel Luna just simply isn't intimidating. In fact, if anything, I'd say he's too human in the part. There's a surprising number of scenes where he's chatty to peripheral characters in a way that the previous Terminators didn't do unless it was absolutely necessary, and it takes away from the idea that he's meant to be a relentless killing machine. And also, he just doesn't carry himself properly. Robert Patrick in Terminator 2 was like a shark. He genuinely felt like a threat even though he was actually much smaller in stature than Schwarzenegger was. But yet, he was very, very distinctive and very memorable, and every time Luna's on screen, you just find yourself comparing him to him and finding him totally inferior. He just doesn't look right the entire time. There's also the fact that in an attempt to make the Rev-9 seem like a legitimate threat, you don't really get a sense of what its limitations are. So, in the very first action beat, they deliberately drop a car engine on the endoskeleton to make sure that you know that it can't be crushed, like the T-800 in the original film. There's also, in the very same scene, the fact that his liquid metal hand turns into a gun, which is something that the T-1000 couldn't do, but also I don't think he actually does all that often, but even so, raises a problem because that was a deliberate attempt to add some kind of limitation to the T-1000. This one doesn't seem to have any, so we don't spend the movie trying to work out how it can be defeated. Speaking of Terminators, one of the major highlights for me was the return of Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's always great to see him back on screen, and it's again playing with the idea that was in Genesis of him being an aged Terminator. There's something quite poignant about the fact that the role has grown old alongside him, but this takes a lot more advantage of it. He's playing a Terminator that has essentially grown its own conscience. He's blended in, he's got a very mundane job that is essentially used as a prop for a load of jokes. He calls himself Carl. That's sort of an interesting idea. It continues that theme from Terminator 2 of, well, if a machine can change, maybe we can too. It takes that to another level, and Schwarzenegger pitches this about right. There's a couple of comic moments that I think strays a little bit too far, but otherwise there is a genuine sense of this might be the last time out, and it does feel fairly bittersweet in terms of his appearance. The filmmakers also wisely put him as a supporting character. He doesn't really appear until about 70 minutes in. They use him fairly sparingly, but even so, they take very full advantage of him, and it's great to see him interacting with Houghton again. He's definitely, I think, one of the elements that improves the film, it again connects with the humanity of the Terminator franchise that elevates it above just another sci-fi movie. The film starts falling apart as it heads into the third act, which is essentially a bunch of action set pieces taped together, but not a lot of it is especially well staged. A big reason for that is that the CGI is very inconsistent in quality. There's some fairly good shots, but there's a lot of very, very obvious CGI doubles. The camera gets way too close to them, you can tell that the skin texture is plasticky, and often they look distractingly weightless. 
Okay, literally so at one point during a plane crash sequence, but even so, they definitely act like the laws of physics don't apply to them. They just don't look like they're actually there. You can tell when they've done the swap from an actor to their digital counterpart. It's very very keenly noticed. The reason that T2 has aged so well is that most of the effects weren't done computer. Yes, there was obviously the shots of the T-1000, but a lot of that was actually done practically. It was there on set with puppets and everything. Dark Fate does the same thing that many of the other Terminator films have done, where they just do all the effects in CGI, and it just looks distractingly fake, but especially so in the two final set pieces heading up to the finale, where you have the plane crash, which is obviously all done on green screens from the looks of it, but also the damn sequence as well. And not helping this is that a lot of it is done in the dark, it's all set at night, you can barely make out what's happening, and then the struggle ends up in the water, which just makes things even murkier and hard to see. Whose idea was it to go, you know what, a good place to set an action sequence is entirely underwater where you can barely work out what's happening. That really did frustrate me. And Terminator 2 did have a very, very prolonged finale. It's something that exhausts you by the end of it. You feel like the characters in that scenario, but kind of in a good way, you feel a sense of relief by the end of it. Dark Fate tries to do that, and you just want it to end. You just want it to finally get it over with. There's at least one moment where it has a false finish, and then it suddenly gears back up again, and I go, how did the characters survive that in the first place? It makes no sense. Can we just end it instead of just trying to pad it out for another 10 minutes or so? Terminator Dark Fate is a flawed but valiant attempt at trying to recapture the spirit of the Cameron films, and for that reason, it's probably the best entry since T2, but I'm not even sure if that's really all that high a bar, especially because it pales in comparison to the original two classics, and as I was walking out of it, I wasn't sure if it was really that much better than Rise of the Machines. While Tim Miller is clearly a fan of the franchise, I think that's more gone in the way more than anything else, but at least he's reconnected it with its humanity. And there are some interesting new ideas here, it just doesn't make the most of them, and that's the biggest problem. This really need to be a home run, at least to try and clear away the bad taste of all the sequels that came before it. This is meant to be the one last chance, and I don't know if it's good enough to really connect with audiences that way. I think that most audiences will be fairly apathetic towards it, honestly. For a series which has said the future is not set and has gone to prove it with two reboots in four years, it seems like the subtitle Dark Fate more refers to its own franchise. Terminator Dark Fate once again tries to reboot the beleaguered franchise, with Tim Miller's direction bringing back a welcome grit and intensity, particularly in an exciting opening act. The return of Linda Hamilton also restores a humanity that elevated the original films, and Mackenzie Davis holds her own as an action hero, but the script sets up more interesting directions to take these characters it doesn't follow through on. Instead, the structure is too close to the series' usual rhythms, and the fan service references, big and small, doesn't help with that. Gabriel Luna's new Terminator fails to be truly menacing, but Schwarzenegger's return to his signature role adds some welcome poignancy and humour. The last act is let down by an overly extended conclusion in murky conditions and inconsistent effects, and loses much of that early energy. Although it is probably your best entry since T2, it doesn't match the heights of Cameron's films, but at least it tries. If you like this review, then bring your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle over to my Patreon, where you can see my reviews early among other perks, including access to my Discord server, but until next time, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out.